This is going to be the first part of my constructive criticism aimed at the YouTubers that Teal Deer mentioned in the supposed red pilling of Lacey Green. Right now, I want to make it absolutely clear that I don't have a bony pick with any of these YouTubers. I'm not jealous that they're more popular than I am, and I even like some of their videos. But looking at things as someone who sees feminism and social justice as detrimental to the progression of society, I have to take issue with some of the arguments they make and the way they present them. Now, that doesn't mean that I want for any of them to stop making videos, or that you should even stop watching their content, but I am worried about the kind of impact that their content has on the larger community of people who could be described as anti-feminist or anti-SJW. Like I said, this is supposed to be constructive criticism. I'm not presenting this as a way to pwn them, I'm just going to be showcasing where their arguments fall short and why. And of course, their mistakes aren't exclusive to just them. This video is open to everyone who makes anti-feminist content because it's important for all of us to make the best possible arguments that we can, that is, if we're going to try to stop feminism from having a negative impact on Western society. So, in this video, we'll be looking exclusively at one of Roaming Millennial's videos. Now, I know this isn't the best video of hers, but it does let me show a lot of the issues and the arguments she makes in her videos. The way I see this, I should be pointing out the things that Roaming does in her videos that she should watch out for in the future so she doesn't make the same mistakes again. In addition to that, gender is a topic that people on our side talk about a lot, and a lot of the failures I see in this video are things that I see in other people's videos as well. So I'm taking this as a great opportunity to address what I see from this community of content creators more broadly. When I was listening to Lacey's arguments for non-binary or multiple genders, one thing I noticed is that LGBT feminists or social justice activists, whatever you want to call them, they all tend to stick to the same few talking points when making their case, and I don't find any of them particularly convincing. So in this video, we're going to be going through those most commonly used arguments in support of non-binary or I suppose non-traditional genders, one by one, deconstructing them and explaining why, yes, at the end of the day, there really are just only two genders. Remember that this is the stated goal of this video. Roaming is intent on deconstructing common arguments for non-binary genders and proving that there are only two genders. This is the premise that Roaming has set for herself, and this is the criteria that I'll be using to judge the effectiveness of her arguments. So this means I'll be looking for two things. Number one, is her argument a valid counter-argument for the idea she's responding to? And number two, does she meet her stated goal of proving that there are only two genders? We need to look at this objectively to determine the strength of her arguments, and she's given us a goal so we need to see if her video lives up to it. The point I probably hear brought up the most often by the people who think that binary genders are just way too restrictive is that those of us who do believe in just male and female genders are confusing gender with sex. She is 100% accurate in this statement. What you'll hear most often is that someone is confusing gender with sex, and there is a correct way to respond to this statement. To make an argument against this, you'll want to establish that you have a clear understanding of the differences between sex and gender. I think the argument usually goes that even though, yes, there may be two biological sexes, there are any number of genders. You see, sex is biological since it's tied to our reproductive functions, but since gender is based on behavior and societal norms and self-expression, there are technically infinite amounts of genders. I'm sorry, but no. Look, I acknowledge that sex is not the same as gender. They are definitely different. Sex is based on things like hormones, chromosomes, your reproductive organs. And gender, on the other hand, is more behavior and societal based, but you can't ignore that the two are still very much related. Just like there are only two sexes, there are likewise only two genders because yes, your gender is based on your sex. Roaming has started off strong here by pointing out that sex is in fact based on reproductive function and that gender is based on behavior. But let's see if she carries the same pace in her explanation. The next thing that I would expect from her is a definition of gender that explains why gender is based on sex and does not leave room for any additional genders on top of that. But let's see how Roaming handles this. When we talk about gender norms like that girls like pink, that boys like blue, and that girls wear dresses and guys wear suits, those things are of course based entirely in social constructs. There's nothing in our biology that says that girls have to like pink. Regardless of the societies they come from, I'm sorry to say, but there are ways that men and women behave differently by virtue of being men and women. Gender differences that span different time periods and different countries include things like women being more nurturing, men being more aggressive, women being more sensitive, men being more dominant, women typically being the primary caregivers for any children, and men usually being the ones who would go out and earn a living or hunt some buffalo in order to provide for his family. Those gender differences result from our biology, not from society. And here we have reached our first argument into failure. 
All of the examples that Roman gave are things that feminists argue are a result of men and women being socialized to be that way, as opposed to things that result from biology. And in the case of the very last two examples, these are things that are actually socially constructed, but not in the way that feminists will tell you that they are. And her explanation of these things... These gender expectations are based on the fact that men and women do have different hormones running through their bodies, different brain chemistries. We don't act the same because we're not built the same. Doesn't even attempt to explain to the viewer how these things cause unique behavior. It's only her asserting that they are a result of biology. That's the default position. That's what feminists are arguing against. And all she's doing right now is restating the very same thing that feminists argue against without actually addressing their arguments. Because of this, even though the feminist argument is generally incorrect, but Roaming's conclusion is ultimately correct, her argument itself is incomplete. And since the last two examples she gave are caused by societal variables, it makes it really easy for someone responding to it to strike it down. Let's address those last two examples she gave. The connections in the average male brain cause men to be more adept at spatial reasoning, and the kinds of jobs that require the use of spatial reasoning are typically more complex and tend to pay more as a result of that difficulty. And in contrast, the average female brain has connections that lead to greater social cognition, which in turn leads to greater ability to empathize and better parenting in the earlier years of childhood. And the final piece to cap off both these points, and where roaming is incorrect, is that raising a child to kindergarten age is a full-time job, and most people simply cannot afford to send their children to daycare while they work. So the parent that makes the least money typically has to take that time off of work, or look for a job with less hours when the other parent isn't working so that there is always someone at home with the child. Typically, this is the female parent, but not always. And as jobs that prefer the talents that most women have over the talents that most men have are becoming more prominent and paying more, it's causing a notable shift in which parent is staying at home, as well as the dreaded wage gap, which in all of the West favors women instead of men for the younger section of the workforce, who've had the opportunity to form their careers around the current economic situation. These two facets of our society, our economic state and the work habits of men and women, are inextricably linked, and a change in which sex is doing what doesn't stem from social attitudes changing. It starts with the fact that the economy is changing, and as a result, the working habits of both men and women have to change to keep up with it. Roaming would have been correct to say that biology does play a role in this, but it is not the most significant factor. It only explains why individuals tend to make certain career choices, but the economic situation of a given society is what really dictates which parent does what task. Anyways, Let's see how Roaming brings all of this together, and whether or not she's able to achieve either of her stated goals. So basically, that was a really long way of saying that even though, yes, it's true that gender and sex are not the same, they are interrelated, they're connected, you can't divorce them. And like, there are only two sexes, there are only two genders. That... that's it? She didn't even make a conclusive statement as to why there are only two genders. I mean, even if her examples had been 100% spot on, that still wouldn't be an argument against the idea of there being more than two genders. That could only ever be a general explanation of the differences between the two genders that everyone, social justice types included, already believe exist, and that everyone already knows are different. How does this place people whose behavioral traits fall into neither the male or female category? This is what the social justice argument would be based upon, but she's not addressing the focal point of their argument, she's just talking around it. Well, we're only halfway through the video, so maybe I'm not giving her a fair shake just yet. Let's keep going and see if she can still meet either of her two stated goals. Next, this brings us to intersex. How? The quintessential response of any social justice warrior who's just been confronted with the only two sexes, therefore only two genders argument is to bring up intersex people. They'll bring up intersex individuals as cases of someone not being biologically male or female. No. I'm pretty sure that even among social justice types, the idea of there being more than two sexes is still highly controversial. But, if you're going to get into this topic, you really do need to provide a more complete definition of sex to work from. This is exactly why I had to split my response to Bill Nye into two separate videos to cover two different but ultimately related topics. Tread carefully into this one, please. And if someone isn't biologically male or female, how can their gender be male or female? So therefore, non-binary genders must be totally real and legit, right? I mean, it's science. Again, no. The first thing I think it's really important to understand here is that we cannot define human biological norms based on aberrations or deformities. Well, obviously, that's kind of why the word abnormal is the word abnormal. But abnormal doesn't necessarily mean incorrect, which is essentially what you're trying to argue here. 
You are right when you say that intersex conditions are defects, but you need to actually explain why they're defects. And them not being what we normally observe is not the reason for it. And I know both of those words have very strong and very negative connotations, but I don't mean them that way. But plainly put, someone who was born intersex does have a birth abnormality, a birth defect. It's just not the norm. And so when making generalizations about our species, just like we don't say that humans can either have two arms or three arms, and both of them are equally normal, because hey, some people are born with three arms, we also don't say that there are more than two genders just because some people, an extremely small fraction of the population is born intersex. Again, of course. The issue isn't whether or not it's normal. It's by default abnormal, in fact. The issue is whether or not it's correct. Having a third arm is incorrect because it causes loads of issues as the child develops. We stand upright, and the internal workings of our body are based around mirror symmetry along the horizontal axis. Having three arms is going to mean issues with learning how to walk, learning how to run, and just learning how to stand upright. And in the event that a three-armed child does learn these things, which they absolutely can with additional help, it's going to cause a great deal of additional and unnecessary stress upon the spine, which will have to contort itself at all times to support one side of the body being 10% heavier than the other side of the body. And this isn't even factoring in the additional torque that the extra mass causes on the axis of rotation as the body tries to go about its everyday movements. My point is, you can objectively state why having three arms is a defect, and just like I did here, you need to state why sex chromosome abnormalities are a defect if you want to disprove the notion that they're just additional sexes. And another thing that I think is really important to realize is that when these activists bring up intersex people, they make it seem like they're in the state of being neither male nor female. But most intersex conditions do still lend themselves to the individual being easily identifiable as either a man or a woman. I feel like most Tumblr dwellers have this image of intersex people like being born without genitalia and having like a perfect equilibrium of both sexes' hormones. <sighs> Roaming. I really do not think that you've researched this particular topic well enough to talk about it. Tread carefully into what you're about to say next. Intersex conditions include things like having a large clitoris. And I'm sorry, but if you have a clitoris, you're female. And similarly, someone with a micro penis would also be described as being intersex. But again, you have a penis. You are a man. Roaming, did you even look these up to see why they're classified as intersex conditions? This whole intersex issue is way more complicated than you're making it out to be at this particular moment. And I don't really want to explain this because, well, quite frankly, I don't want to get this video dinged by YouTube again for saying the wrong words too many times. But do a Google search for ambiguous genitalia, and after that, do a search for clitoromegaly. Just that alone, without needing to look too far into the medical science behind why these are intersex conditions, should tell you what's wrong with what you're saying right now. I find it really interesting that right now you are on the Intersex Society of North America's website because I know that they explain exactly what's going on with conditions like these and why they take issue with the medical practices and social stigma relating to this topic. I don't agree with their conclusions per se, but when you say things like this, you really leave me with no choice but to assume that you did not read any of the literature on that website. And I would much rather just say that you've misinterpreted it, but you're really not expressing any understanding of it. You are forcing me to say that you don't know what you're talking about, and I really don't like having to say that, but you literally do not appear to know what you're talking about. So let's move on to your final argument. This brings us to our final argument, and this is one that's used by people who themselves identify as non-binary, which is, so you're denying my existence, to which my response is, we're not debating your existence. You clearly exist. What we're talking about is the way that you classify your gender. Yes, exactly. Perfect. What you have just said is spot the fuck on. Please continue this strong. I mean, I don't mean to pick on anybody, but I see a lot of young girls today identifying as non-binary genders based on things like not liking dresses, or not wanting to be a princess, or not liking pink, and things like that. Basically superficial things like personal preferences and fashion choices, as if those comprised your gender. Okay, so we're kind of missing the base framework for this one, but that's okay at this point. Just make a solid argument. I really want you to let me close this on a positive note. 
And I think a lot of this gender confusion comes from the fact that third wave feminism is increasingly trying to paint gender as just this form of self-expression. And if gender is just self-expression, since self-expression is limitless, then gender must be limitless too. So we've kind of managed to work backwards now and we're back at her first argument, even though we're at the end of the video. But you know what? That's fine. That's fine. If she's going to retread the same ground in the same video, she at least has an opportunity to make a stronger argument this time around. But again, because of our biological promptings, that's just not how gender works. Okay, I'm going to stop you right there. The next thing you need to say, since you haven't said it yet, is how gender works. That is the only possible thing you can follow that sentence up with in order to make a rational argument. And I haven't even rewatched the next part of this, so I'm really, really hoping that's what she does. Like, like honestly, I'm not, I'm not bullshitting you right now. I do not know what she's about to say next as I'm writing this. I just want it to be the right thing. Self-expression may be limitless and it may be a facet of gender identity, but it is not the entire part of gender identity. Okay, perfect, perfect, good, good. What is the other part of gender identity? People should be able to behave however they want. It's just that not every behavioral choice equates to its own distinct gender. Okay, you're so close. We are so close to hitting that second stated goal. All you have to do is explain why not every behavioral choice equates to its own unique gender. That's it. Roaming, please, please, just let me have this. Let me give you the victory on this one. Let me say that Teal Deer was wrong and that Roaming fucking nailed it. Just, just let me, let me, let me have this. If you're a girl who hates being feminine and hates makeup and doesn't wear dresses and only wears pants, that's fine. I have no issues with that. But I'm not gonna call you they or non-binary. I'm just gonna call you a tomboy. And that's it for this video. And then I fired, and then I missed, and then I fired, and then I fired, and I missed. I missed both times. <sighs> Anyways, like I said in the beginning, the failures in this video are things that are commonplace on Roaming Millennial's channel. She has a habit of not creating full arguments talking around the argument she's responding to, and sometimes not really having enough of an understanding to make a statement one way or the other on a topic. Like I said earlier, these argumentative failures are not unique to Roaming Millennial, especially as it relates to the topic of gender. Now, I've told you guys this, but like I said, I don't have any malice towards Roaming. She's got a pretty loud voice, and she prides herself on holding debates with people who hold different ideas to herself. And I love that. I love that there is someone who SJWs especially will come to the table with. But if she's going to debate topics like this with other people, she cannot do it on this same level of argumentation. You guys, if you're fans of hers, you really do need to point out when she makes bad arguments like the ones in this video, and really grill her on it. As Sargon has said many, many times, the things that enables him to produce the high quality content that he does is the fact that when he's wrong on something or makes a bad argument, his viewers will ruthlessly call him out and make sure that he knows when he's fucked up. So if you guys, as fans, think that Roaming has potential, then you owe it to her to do the exact same thing. <sighs> I am really not looking forward to doing more of these. Out of all the channels that Tildir mentioned, Roaming Millennial was the second best.